Chapter 10 of Lives of Poor Boys Who Became Famous This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lives of Poor Boys Who Became Famous by Sarah Knowles Bolton Oliver Goldsmith On a low slab in a quiet spot, just north of the Church of Knight Templars, in London, are the simple words, Here lies Oliver Goldsmith. The author of The Vicar of Wakefield needs no grander monument, for he lives in the hearts of the people. Oliver Goldsmith was born in Palace, Ireland, in 1728, the son of a poor minister who, by means of tilling some fields and assisting in a parish outside his own, earned $200 a year for his wife and seven children. When about six years old, Oliver nearly died of smallpox, and his pitted face made him an object of jest among the boys. At eight, he showed great fondness for books and began to write verses. His mother pleaded for a college education for him, but there seemed little prospect of it. One day, when a few were dancing at his uncle's house, the little boy sprang upon the floor and began to dance. The fiddler, to make fun of his short figure and homely face, exclaimed, Aesop! The boy, stung to the quick, replied, Heralds, proclaim aloud, all saying, See Aesop dancing and his monkey playing when, of course, the fiddler became much chagrined. All his school life, Oliver was painfully diffident, but a good scholar. His father finally earned a better salary, and the way seemed open for college, when, lo, his sister, who had the opportunity of marrying a rich man, was obliged, so thought the public opinion of the day, to have a marriage portion of $2,000 and poor Oliver's educational hopes were blasted. He must now enter Trinity College, Dublin, as a sizer, servant, wear a coarse black gown without sleeves, a red cap, the badge of servitude, sweep the courts, carry dishes, and be treated with contempt, which nearly crushed his sensitive nature. A year and a half later, his father died, and his scanty means ceased from that source. To keep from starving, he wrote ballads, selling them to street musicians at $1.25 apiece, and stole out at night to hear them sung. Often he shared this pittance with someone more wretched than himself. One cold night he gave his blankets to a person with five children and crawled into the ticking of his bed for warmth. When a kind friend, who often brought him food, came in the morning, he was obliged to break in the door as Goldsmith could not extricate himself from his bed. Obtaining a small scholarship, he gave a little party in his room in honor of the event. A savage tutor appeared in the midst of the festivities and knocked him down. So incensed was Goldsmith that he ran away from college and with 25 cents in his pocket, started for Cork. For three days he lived on eight cents a day and, by degrees, parted with nearly all his clothes for food. Though wholly unfitted for the ministry, Goldsmith was urged by his relatives to enter the church because he would then have a living. Too young to be accepted, he remained at home for two years assisting his brother Henry in the village school, and then, offering himself as a candidate, was refused. It was said because he appeared before the right reverend in scarlet trousers. After being a tutor for a year, his uncle gave him $250 that he might go to Dublin and study law. On arriving, he met an old friend, lost all his money in playing cards with him, and, ashamed and penniless, returned and begged the forgiveness of his relative. A little more money was given him, and with this he studied medicine in Edinburgh for over a year, 
earning later some money by teaching. Afterward, he traveled in Italy and France, begging his way by singing or playing on his flute at the doors of the peasants, returning to England at twenty-eight years of age without a cent in his pocket. Living among the beggars in Axe Lane, he asked to spread plasters or pound in the mortars of the apothecaries till, finally, a chemist hired him out of pity. Through the aid of a fellow student, he finally opened a doctor's office, but few came to a stranger, and these usually so poor as to be unable to pay. Attending one day upon a workman, he held his hat close to his breast so as to cover a big patch in his second-hand clothes while he felt the patient's pulse. Half guessing the young doctor's poverty, the sick man told him about his master, the author of the famous old novel, Clarissa Harlow, and how he had befriended writers. Goldsmith at once applied for work and became press corrector in Salisbury Court, Fleet Street. Later, he was employed as a reviewer on a magazine. Being obliged to submit all his reviews to an illiterate bookseller and his wife, the engagement soon came to an end. He lived now in a garret, was dunned even for his milk bill, wrote a book for a college friend under whose name it was published, and began a work of his own, Polite Learning in Europe, writing to a wealthy relative for aid to publish, which letter was never answered though it was greatly regretted after Goldsmith became famous. With no hope in London, he was promised a position in the East Indies. Life began to look bright, though his Fleet Street garret, with one chair, was surrounded by swarms of children and dirt. The promise was not kept, and he applied for the position of hospital maid. His clothes being too poor for him to be seen on the streets, he pledged the money to be received for four articles, bought a new suit, went up to the court of examiners, and was rejected. Had any of these positions been obtained, the world, doubtless, would never have known the genius of Oliver Goldsmith. He went back to his garret to write, pawned his clothes to pay the landlady, who was herself to be turned out of the wretched lodgings, sold his Life of Voltaire for $20, and published his Polite Learning in Europe anonymously. The critics attacked it, and Goldsmith's day of fame had dawned at last. The Citizen of the World, a good-natured satire on society, next appeared and was a success. Dr. Johnson became his friend and made him a member of his club with Reynolds, Burke, and other noted men. The Traveler was next published with an immense sale. Goldsmith now moved into the buildings which bear his name, near Temple Church, and for once had flowers and green grass to look out upon. He was still poor, doubtless spending what money he received with little wisdom. His landlady arrested him for room rent, upon hearing which Dr. Johnson came at once to see him, gave him money, took from his desk the manuscript of the Vicar of Wakefield and sold it to a publisher for $300. This was the fruit of much labor, and the world received it cordially. Some of his essays were now reprinted 16 times. What a change from the Fleet Street Garret! The Deserted Village was published five years later, Goldsmith having spent two whole years in reviewing it after it was written. So careful was he that every word should be the best that could be chosen. This was translated at once into German by Goethe, who was also a great admirer of the Vicar of Wakefield. He also wrote an English history, a Roman, a Grecian, several dramas, of which She Stoops to Conquer was the most popular, and eight volumes of The History of the Earth an animated nature, for which he received $500 a volume, leaving this unfinished. Still in debt, overworked, laboring sometimes far into the morning hours, 
not leaving his desk for weeks together, even for exercise, Goldsmith died at 45, broken with the struggle of life, but with undying fame. When he was buried, one April day, 1774, Brick Court and the stairs of the building were filled with the poor and forsaken whom he had befriended. His monument is in the Poet's Corner at Westminster Abbey, the greatest honor England could offer. True, she let him nearly starve, but she crowned him at the last. He conquered the world by hard work, kindness, and a gentleness as beautiful as his genius was great. End of chapter 10 Recording by Lucretia B.